All right. Um, well, let's get into the word. I'm excited. Um, I-, I want you to imagine just for a moment this kind of picture. Imagine Jesus and his disciples standing around, and there's a large crowd all around them. Everybody's pressing in. Everybody's watching what Jesus is going to do, um, eager to be around Jesus. And a man breaks through the crowd, rushes up, and throws himself at Jesus' feet. And now I'm sure the crowd is like, what's going on, right? <clears throat> and um, the man begins to beg Jesus to heal his son. He begins to tell Jesus that his son is being tormented by seizures and that he's suffering. And I'm sure at this moment, the crowd is just like really leaned into the story. Like, what's Jesus going to do? Right? And then the man continues to tell his story. And he says, well, well, Jesus, you know, my son is suffering. Please heal him. Please heal him. But Jesus, I I brought him to your disciples and they couldn't heal him. I'm sure the disciples that are standing there are like, bro, really? 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 Like, right here? Like, you couldn't have said that privately? Like, you got to out us in front of the whole crowd, you know? And um, Jesus' response is interesting. Intense is maybe a better word. Because, you know, you might expect Jesus to just be like, it's okay, guys, next time. Good try, you know? That is not his response to his disciples, his friends, right? This is what he says to them in Matthew 17, 17 and 18. He looks to them and he says, I'm sure he sighed. You unbelieving and perverse generation. (laughs) Wow. Okay, Jesus. How long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy here to me. Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of the boy, and he was healed at that moment. Awkward. That was awkward. That whole situation was real awkward, right? I am imagining the disciples, like, heads hanging, like, dude, we just got shamed. Like, this was like, dang it. Like, we, we like, what's going on? And if you know the story, they come to Jesus privately. And, of course, Jesus wasn't shaming them. But um, he comes to them privately. They, they come to him, and they're like, Jesus, why couldn't we cast out this demon? What was stopping us from moving in the supernatural? Why couldn't we get the breakthrough? And Jesus answers them in Matthew 17, 20, and he says, he replies, because you have so little faith. Truly, I tell you, and Jesus is truth, right? Jesus is truth. He is the word. He is true. He cannot lie. It is not in him to lie. So he's telling the truth. He says, truly, I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. See, Jesus uses this moment to teach his disciples that often their faith or lack of faith is the deciding factor in whether we see breakthrough or not. Often it's the deciding factor, not always, but often the deciding factor. And if we see the supernatural, if we see a healing, if we see deliverance, if we see things change... He says, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move, and it will. Nothing will be impossible. Once again, Jesus cannot lie. So Jesus is telling us, with faith, nothing, nothing, anything you could think of, anything you could, any scenario you could imagine that is as horrific as it could ever be, that is most difficult as it could ever be, nothing is impossible when faith is involved. Why did Jesus choose the language of moving mountains? You know, that seems a little extreme, right? Um, Not long after this, four chapters later, Jesus, um, if you remember the story, there's this moment where Jesus is coming into Jerusalem and there's a a fruitless fig tree. And Jesus withers it, basically. And it's a, a prophetic picture. He withers this fruit tree and they're watching a tree just wither in front of their eyes. They're like, whoa, like freaking out, right? Like, how did Jesus just do that? And um, they're in awe. And once again, he says to them, Matthew 21, 21, he tells them, truly, I tell you, if you have faith and do not doubt, not only can you do what was done to this fig tree, but also you can say to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and it will be done. 
Twice, Jesus points out to his disciples, mountains can be moved. Mountains can be moved. What does moving a mountain represent? Um, You know, I don't know if there's like some biblical dictionary somewhere that tells you these things, but to me, it means a complete physical impossibility. I don't know about you, but I don't like wake up and just, oh, I'm going to move a mountain and go move a mountain, right? Like, it is completely impossible. Moving a mountain represents something that is utterly humanly impossible, way too difficult to be done. Nobody would even fathom that you could move like, you know, a mountain range, especially in a day with like no modern technology or equipment, right? Like this is, Jesus is saying the most difficult thing you could ever perceive is actually able to be done if faith is involved. Nothing is impossible. You know, in both of these examples that Jesus gives, he cites faith as the key to moving mountains. First one, right, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, and the second one, if you have faith and do not doubt. According to Jesus, faith is the the precursor for something that's physically impossible to become possible. Jesus is serious in his language and his attitude and his approach that his disciples understand that lack of faith is not part of the equation of following Jesus. Have you noticed Jesus is not like, hey, there, which, you know, which Christianity do you want to sign up for? Like, you know, the real, like, follow Jesus Christianity or, like, Christianity light? And if you want Christianity light, that's just, like, feel good, you know, get saved, but, like, don't believe God can ever do anything powerful. And there's entire denominations that are literally built off of Christianity light. But the reality is, when you look at the Bible, there is absolute, when you look at Christianity, following Jesus, the way of Jesus, there is nothing that is not supernatural. Everything about Jesus is supernatural. Every, I mean, he, if you, your entire salvation is based off of the fact that you believe somebody was resurrected from the dead. Like, there is, you cannot separate Christianity from the supernatural. It is who God is. Jesus was born of a virgin birth. I mean, what about that is not supernatural, right? There is no Christianity light. Jesus was adamant that his disciples understood. Like he didn't, he wasn't casual in his like, oh, you don't have faith. He was, I mean, you wicked and perverse generation. I mean, that's intense. He's coming for the throat. Like he he was like, you've got to understand that faith is vital. You can't play games with this. Faith is the key that's going to make you powerful in this world. And so he was, he was passionate about teaching his disciples to truly understand how, how vital faith is. You see, mountains were made to be moved. The creator who made mountains says mountains can move. You know, one time I had this um, interesting experience. I'm going to tell you two stories today, one a little later, but... Um, of some, a time that I, I was working in southern Sudan. This was about 2002, I think it was about 2002, maybe 2003. Um, this was the time before southern Sudan had become its own state. It was, um, hey buddy, did you win? Good job. Um, goalie of the year over here, this kid. <laughs> um, it was a time when there was active war. The, the northern Sudan, which was primarily Muslim, they were attacking the primarily Christian south. Um, so many Christians had been martyred in the south. It was horrific. It was tragic. I mean, complete active war. Um, every, it was so desolated. Um, all the buildings had been bombed out. There was no infrastructure. I mean, it was horrific, okay? And... Um, even the fact how I got in there was com- completely miraculous, but there was an incredible NGO um, working in the area, helping the kids, and they connected me with the rebel army. And the rebel army in the south um, said, we will personally bring you in if, I consider this to be one of the biggest honors of my life to this day. They said there are thousands and thousands and thousands of children in southern Sudan whose parents have been martyred for their faith. 
And there's an entire generation of children who've not even heard the gospel. Kids whose parents were martyred. And they have been orphaned. And there's been so much war and desolation, they haven't even heard the gospel. And I was, had this beautiful privilege to go in um, with the rebel army, which was insanely crazy, and to get to preach the gospel to children in southern Sudan who were literally living in caves, living under trees. I mean, it was crazy. Um, it was a very powerful and incredible time. But one of the things that happened when I was there on that first, that first trip, um, some of the Christians there were telling me about a prophecy, that a prophet had had a word for them. And the word was, they were like, what a strange word, right? They're telling me about this word. And the word was um, that southern Sudan would be liberated. That southern Sudan would be liberated. And a sign that their liberation was close was that the fallen tree would stand again. Strange. Well, of course, because God's crazy. Because God is just downright crazy, and he can do whatever the heck he wants. Who am I to deny what the Lord can do, right? Like, not me. Don't find me denying, okay? What happened was, I saw with my own eyes this giant oak tree that had fallen. I don't know if it had rotted. I don't know. I I don't know. I'm not an arbalist. What's the word? Did I do it right? Okay, good. (laughs) Um, not an arbalist. I'm not sure why it had fallen. Um, a giant tree. And a couple days after this prophetic word, all the villagers come out. The dang tree is standing. You guys, this is crazy. I don't know if this happens to you, but like, what? I saw the tree standing. And I saw the pictures of the tree not standing, and everybody's like freaking out telling me the story, right? I'm like, what in the world? This giant tree in a land, in an area where it's completely desolated, where there's no like, oh, let me go get like some tractor and pull this tree up. No, like nothing. And they wake up in the morning and the tree is standing again. And shortly after, southern Sudan um, was liberated. And it's still very much in there's a lot of conflict, but um, they gained their independence, and it's been, a, it's been a whole thing. But listen, if God can move a mountain, if God can raise a tree, it doesn't matter what physical impossibility you're facing, God can do it. Are, are we awake this morning? Are we okay? Y'all are not. You are not giving me back what I need in this morning. I just told you that your God is alive and still does miracles. And you're all like, cool, where's the bake sale? (sighs) Listen, mountains can be moved. This is the kingdom we're a part of. Let me tell you what else God can do. God can silence storms. All right? Remember in Mark 4, 35? That day when evening came... Jesus said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. (laughs) I love Jesus. Just chilling. The disciples woke him up and said to him, teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up. He rebuked the wind and he said to the waves, quiet, be still. Then the wind died down and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and they asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. You know, it's interesting about this story. Jesus had told them to come with him to the other side, right? Jesus had invited them on this journey. Jesus was was with them in the middle of this storm. You know what this tells me? You can be right in the middle of God's will, doing exactly what he's called you to do, in perfect obedience, and still weather a storm. 
Just become, because a storm is raging doesn't mean you've somehow missed it unless you're like Jonah. Okay, there are some examples. But you can be right where you're supposed to be, doing the very thing God has called you to do, and still in the midst of it, God is with you, and in the midst of it, you go through a terrible storm. But notice, Jesus is there the whole time. He never leaves them. He's right there with them. This whole trip was his idea. He was like, let's get on the boat. <laughs> like, this was all his deal. Right? And he told them, let's go to the other side. Which should have given them comfort because he didn't say, let's go into the sea and die. He said, we're going to the other side. Right? So often, God speaks things over our life. We're trying to follow God. And the second, the second... It gets a little stormy. It gets a little windy. Right? The second we're getting tossed around, the second we're getting a little seasick with all this, the second it gets hard, notice how they respond. They turn to Jesus and they say, don't you care if we drown? <laughs> you guys, I feel personally attacked. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I genuinely hate it when the Bible does this. I'm like, ew, get out of my life. Get out of my business. How true is this, right? Now, mind you, they had just witnessed all the fish and the bread multiplying and everybody eating and miracles, miracles, miracles. How often we know God does miracles. We've seen God do miracles. But the second our own personal security gets a little shaky, we start coming questioning the character of God. The second we start feeling, a, it starts getting personal, the second there's a storm in my marriage, in my career, in my health, in my finances, whatever. Do you even care, God? Where are you? Right? We start, we start making accusations about his character, about his presence, about his goodness. And let me tell you, that's, that's, not, that's not a good road. That does not lead to good things in our life. Right? Jesus was with them. In fact, he was with them in the middle of the storm. He wasn't worried. He was chilling. He had a pillow. He was out. He was like, I don't even need melatonin. I'm out. He was good. He was right there the whole time. Jesus gets up and he rebukes the wind and he says to the waves, quiet, be still. And instantly the wind died down and it was calm. Can you imagine that moment? Creator speaking to creation creation falling into perfect alignment at the voice of the creator. Even the wind and the waves obey him. Even the weather obeys him. All of creation attentive to his voice. With one word, the raging storm is stilled. With one word, the terrifying circumstances that, that made them feel so helpless are stopped. In a moment, it all shifts. Verse 39 says, the wind died down and it was completely calm. Here's the reality I want to remind us this morning. Jesus can shift raging dynamics in your life in a moment. Jesus can shift stormy circumstances, scary, vulnerable terrifying things happening in a moment. Do you remember this about your God? That our God is the God who speaks to storms and they listen? See, the reality is sometimes there's moments where, where Jesus will speak to a storm in your life and it will shift. And there's moments you actually have to weather the storm with him in the boat. And let me tell you what, both take faith. Both take a lot of faith. Notice what Jesus points them back to in that moment. Why are you afraid? Do you still not have faith? Just like the mountain situation, right? You need faith. Just like them earlier casting out the demon with the little, you need faith. Do you still not have faith, right? He's, he's challenging them. Your faith is the key. Your faith is the thing that, that brings the breakthrough. He's coming for their lack of faith. I mean, it feels like it would be totally 
you know, acceptable to be terrified if you're in a rickety little boat in the middle of the sea and there's a storm. But Jesus is like, fear is not your portion. Why are you afraid? I'm right here. I'm with you. You're right where you're supposed to be. You've heard me say this before. It is better, to, the best, the safest place for you to be is right where God has called you to be. If that's a war zone, if that's living in some crazy neighborhood, wherever it is, the safest place for you to be is where God has called you to be. You are actually safer living in an active war zone if God's called you there than living in Beverly Hills if you're not supposed to be there. That's the truth. I don't know why I said Beverly Hills. I don't know. I just picked somewhere else. But whatever. It came out. (laughs) The safest place to be is where God's called you to be. And Jesus is coming for their faith. Faith is the game changer. Friends, we don't have to be victims to the storms in life. We don't have to freak out like everybody else around us. And let me tell you, there's a lot of storms. There are political storms, there are economic storms, there's health storms, there's relational storms. There's a lot of storms in the world and people are desperate to see a God who can silence and deal with the storms. We cannot be like the rest of the world, tossed around, freaking, freaking out. When we know a God who can speak to the storm. Mountains can be moved. Storms can be stilled. And the last thing I want to talk about, listen, I didn't even tell our tech team that the, they're asking for a title slide. I didn't tell them because I was like, it's weird. I don't know. Because the only title I could come up with with this sermon is um, Mountains, Storms, and Demons. Okay, so here we are. <laughs> um, I'm like, nobody's going to want to listen to that on the podcast. <laughs> um, I, I want to read another story to you, Matthew 15, 22 through 29. A Canaanite woman from the vicinity came to Jesus, crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is demon-possessed and suffering terribly. Jesus did not answer a word. So his disciples came to him and urged him, send her away, for she keeps crying out after us. Ew. (laughs) He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. The woman came and knelt before him. Lord, help me, she said. He replied, it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Yes, it is, Lord, she said. Even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus said to her, woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed at that moment. You know, I'll be honest, when I first read this story, I was like, Ew, I do not like your tone, Jesus. I do not like the way you're talking to her. You need to come correct. What is happening? Like, it just kind of threw me off a little bit. I was like, what's happening? Um, But the more I dug into this, I realized that this is actually a beautiful thing that's happening in this moment. You know, earlier in the chapter, we we read that Jesus had withdrawn um, far away up the coast to this region where this woman was. And, you know, he was not simply trying to get away. Well, there was a couple things happening. One, he's trying to get away from the difficulties he was experiencing in in Israel where nobody believed he was the Messiah. The, The Jewish people were rejecting him. Give us a sign. Prove yourself. They were rejecting the Messiah that had come for them. Right, so he's, there's all this drama, and he's just trying to get a break, trying to get away for a minute. But we also know this about Jesus. Jesus never does anything casually. Jesus is incredibly intentional. You might remember the story where he said, well, we had to go through Samaria. Nobody has to go through Samaria, right? Jesus went to Samaria because there was a woman at the well he wanted to encounter, right? He didn't just casually end up in, Jesus didn't casually end up anywhere. Jesus, every step is intentional. Every step is calculated. Every word is calculated, okay? So Jesus comes in pursuit of this woman. Jesus is getting a break from all the drama he's getting in Israel. And he comes to this region because there's a woman who's hungry for him. And so we we see this encounter. Um, Upon first, you know, reading the story, it can feel a little bit like Jesus is being rude. Um, Maybe he's not willing to answer her her request because of her ethnicity. Um, 
But what we also see in this story is that this woman was not giving up. She keeps pleading, you know, even from her Canaanite background, even knowing she's, she's not Jewish. Um, and it's something that's actually really beautiful that happens because at first Jesus is silent. And I think in this moment he's waiting to see, like, will she persevere? Because here's what Jesus was not finding in Israel, faith. And he comes out to this region to a Gentile and he sees this woman where there's hunger, and he, he allows for just a pause for a moment. Does she really want me? Does she really believe I can heal her daughter? And he just leaves a little pause. Anybody ever experienced a little pause, like, could you speak, Jesus? Could you hurry up? You know what I mean? Just a little pause, like 10 years, no. But just a little pause <laughs> where he's just kind of like, do so you really believe? But what happens next, I think, is the, the powerful moment. Because was, he was letting his disciples witness something. The actual opposite of what they were experiencing in Israel, they began to experience before their eyes. Jesus was on a mission to teach them about faith. Let's remember that. And this woman, he's like, you know, just as an answer, he, he, she keeps pressing in. Jesus. I know you can heal my daughter. I know you're the savior. I know you're the Messiah. I know you are powerful and you can do it. And he's like, yeah, but you know, you know, I, my mission is to the Jews. Doesn't matter. I know who you are. I know you can do it. Yeah. But like, shouldn't it just be for them? And like the crumbs, I mean, he's like borderline offensive at this point. And she's like, I know who you are. There's this faith that's just rising up in this woman. And it's modeling to the disciples what faith looks like. And he looks to her and he's like, your faith is so beautiful. Your faith has just healed your daughter. And this woman's daughter gets set free because of the mother's faith. Breaks it open. This is a powerful moment. Jesus completely delivers this child of demonic oppression you know, sometimes here in the West, we get, and depending on your cultural background or your church background, um, I think oftentimes we get a bit of a sterilized, um, I don't know, version of spirituality, and we forget that the spirit realm is real, just in case you needed a reminder. The kingdom of light is real. The kingdom of darkness is real. We don't have to be afraid of the kingdom of darkness. We have full authority over every demonic principality spirit. We have full authority. We don't have to fear or be in anxiety about it. But the spirit realm is real. And, you know, I think sometimes we, we forget that. And um, the reality is we see, though, all around us demonic oppression. You see it in your family, you see it in your friends, you probably see it in yourself, you might even see it in your dog. Like, there is demonic oppression, you're like, I don't even know, like, what is going on? And here's the reality. Not only does God move mountains, not only does God quiet storms, but God fully transforms and delivers and heals and sets us free from demonic possession, oppression, whatever. You know, um, here's the other story I was going to tell you about Sudan. Um, I had this experience. At this point, I had been living in, in Africa for a couple years and had seen a lot of things. And um, so when this knock came on my door that morning, I knew that this was, I knew it was serious, but somebody knocked on my door. I had been um, every day ministering to, in the evenings, in the mornings, I would go out to all these places where all the younger kids were. And in the evenings, I would come back to um, this NGO we were working with, they had a, um, these big kind of dorms, and they put about 200 girls in one and 200 boys in the other, teenagers. And it was like thatched roof, mud floor, mud walls, very simple. And, um, and then during the day, they would give them like some classes and stuff, um, trying to create a little bit of normalcy in the middle of war. And, um, and so I was staying in a little hut next to them, and it had been raining. It had been raining for like two days, Everything was mud. I mean, just pure mud everywhere. They're 
room they're sleeping in. They're sleeping on a mud floor, right? So it is now wet. It is mud everywhere. I mean, it was just totally crazy. And um, I get a knock on my door at like five in the morning. It's pouring rain. And um, this guy, he's like, we need your help. Quick, we need your help. And I'm like, what's going on? And um, he said, there's a girl in the girl's dorm who's demon-possessed. And everybody's afraid. And we've been trying for hours to help her. We don't know how to help her. And I was like, is there a Starbucks between here? And no, okay, <clears throat> here we go. And I was just like, all right. Now, I had with me a couple of teenagers from a very, very, very conservative church in the area I grew up in. I don't think these kids had ever seen, like, I mean, even drums in church, let alone, like, <laughs> what they're about to see, right? I was like, they are going to be traumatized. I knew. I knew what was coming. I was like, oh, dear God. And um, I was like, they're probably thinking, like, oh, somebody's having a bad day. We're going to pray for her. And I was like, <sighs> let's go. So that's all I got. It's my little ministry team. And, um, you know, I can hear just the screaming and all the things as we're approaching. And um, there's like a little, you know, door, basically a cutout in the mud wall. And um, I have to step over the body, I mean, she's alive, but body of this girl who is possessed to get in the room. And as I enter, I'm like, oh my gosh, I look at her and there's this girl and she is laying on the ground and she's just, her whole body is vibrating, eyes rolled back, growling, the whole thing. And um, <clears throat> I step in and the second I, I'm just like getting my bearings, right? And I see 200 girls pressed up against the wall, freaked out. I mean, they are terrified. They're all crying. They're holding each other. They are so freaked out. And um, honestly, I was so mad. I was so mad. I'm like, devil, who the heck do you think you are? I'm so mad because I have been preaching to these kids every day, and I have, had never experienced this, none of them were getting saved. And I didn't find out till later that it was because they knew to say yes to Jesus meant they were probably going to die. And so they would sit for hours. I would, like, preach for three hours, and, and literally nobody would get saved. And I'm like, what is happening? And the teachers would tell me they, would, they wouldn't even leave the room. I'd leave at the end of the service, go back, and they said they would sit there all night and just weep, contemplating because they wanted Jesus, but they were so scared. And I was like, so the fact that the devil is doing it, I am so mad. I'm like, oh, heck, no, if you're going to show off and make a, uh-uh, we're not doing this. I'm, so this poor girl, this poor girl is, her body is being thrown all over the room. I mean, she just, her body would get picked up and thrown like seven feet. That's why they're screaming against the wall, right? And it's happening just very, very, very crazy. And, um, I began to pray. Well, actually, before, <clears throat> before I pray, I was like just getting my bearings, right? I'm, I just woke up like all of 10 minutes ago, right? I'm like, okay. And I just whispered. I was like, Jesus. I just did that. The second I said the name Jesus, this precious girl, she's about 15 years old, her body gets thrown. She's on her face. She gets thrown about seven feet lands on her back with her arms over her head. And I don't know how to explain this because it's so weird. She gets pulled out of the room, like laying flat on her back with her arms over her head, like somebody's pulling her by the wrists. Yeah, weird. Gets pulled. She's being pulled out of the room, basically, by demons, right? Now, my poor little team, they are up against the wall with everybody else. <laughs> they have lost their minds, okay? Okay. I was like, grab her ankles. You know, they're like, no. And I'm like, grab her ankles. Like, she is, the poor girl's getting drugged out of this room, you know? So they were like, <laughs> like, grab her ankles and begin to minister to her and um, just, you know, just ministering to her and, and just praying over her. And I'm like, Holy Spirit, what do we do? Because there are some good tools and strategies, but really, we have to rely on the Holy Spirit for everything, for everything, right? And so I'm like, Holy Spirit, what do I do? And I felt like the Lord said in that moment, you can cast this demon out, but it actually has rights to her. 
So it's going to come back and it's going to be worse unless she chooses freedom. And I was like, how do you get somebody in this state to choose freedom? <laughs> so I felt like God was like, you know, tell this demon, it, you know, that it doesn't have a right to speak, whatever. So I start, you know, just silencing the demon. I begin to speak to her spirit and I begin to just speak truth and life to her. And I begin to, you know, as she would kind of come to minister to her, speak to her about who Christ is and tell her, you know, her name was Betty. And I said, Betty, um, you know, I, everything the Lord had told me, right? I can cast this out, but y- this has a right to you. Do you want to be free? All 200 girls that hadn't gotten saved all week are screaming from the sides, Betty, do it. Just get saved. Like, they know it's going to set this poor girl free, right? They are so traumatized for her. They just want her to get saved so that she can be free. And I'm like, classic. Where were all y'all last night, you know? And, uh, and they're crying and this whole thing. But finally, Betty, you know, comes into agreement. She's like, I want Jesus. And in that moment, we cast out the demon. This girl gets completely set free. She looks like a completely different person. Teachers take her off. She goes and gets bathed up. She comes back in the brightest yellow dress, full of smiles, this timid, sweet girl. And she begins to tell her story. How as a baby, you know, her parents did a blood pact with, who knows, some witch doctor or something, and that she has been tormented by this demon her whole life. And she feels so, so new. She feels so, she's never felt this peace before. And um, I'll tell you what, like, long story short, Betty went on to lead revival in that school. She went on to, her and another boy led all of their classmates to Jesus. During war, they would hear the Holy Spirit say, tell everybody tonight to hide. Tell everybody whatever. And they, they were kept safe. They were having angelic visitations. Her, she went on to go in, she ended up in Uganda in, in, in a school of ministry. She went on to become a minister. Betty, like, changed the world. Like, changed her world, right? God radically transformed Betty's life. Betty was radically delivered. But this is the God we serve. And I think sometimes in the West, we forget how powerful our God is. God moves mountains. God silences storms. And God frees from demons. You guys still with me? I'm almost done. Mark 9, 23. Jesus said, all things are possible for the one who believes and trusts in me. In another translation, it says, everything is possible for the person who has faith. All things are possible. All things are possible. There is no scenario too too big, right? No impossibility too crazy. No natural circumstance, no diagnosis, no issue, no relational dynamic. There is nothing that is too big for our God. Our God does the impossible. All things are possible for the person who has faith. And church, here at Expression, we are a community of faith. We're not here for Christianity light. We are here because we know and we have seen and we believe in and we are surrendered to the Lord who does the impossible. You know, we live in a time in history where there are so many mountains that need to be moved. Mountains of injustice, mountains of pain that need to be moved. There are so many storms that need calming. In your community, in your family, in your workplace, there are so many storms. There's so much demonic oppression, and we are not victims to these things. The world doesn't need more people who can analyze mountains and complain about the weather complain about the economy, complain about the storms. More people who can say, oh, it's so dark. (laughs) There's plenty of people doing that. There's plenty of Christians doing that. The world needs people who knows that their God can shift things, that knows that their God does the impossible, and that understands that the kingdom of God is within them, that God is within them, and that is enough that understand that we are not victims to the world around us and that we are called to see things shift. I don't know about you, but I have been feeling this stirring in my spirit, church, that we've got to get our fight back. 
We've got to get our fight back. I feel like the enemy has been on a rampage in my life, in the life of so many people I love, to drain us of our faith, to weaken our faith, just to go, well, I guess it's just going to be like this, to get us to roll over, to get us to, to lower our expectation. The enemy's always on a mission to try to you know, weaken your faith. But the last couple of years, I've, I've seen so many Christians who, who used to believe for miracles now just kind of being like, I don't know. And I'm telling you what, this morning, this is a call for you to get your fight back. Because our God does the impossible. We've seen it. We know it. Listen, raise your hand if you have seen God do a crazy miracle that is completely unexplainable outside of God. Look around the room. That's a lot of people. That's a lot of people. This is who our God is. 1 Corinthians 4.20, for the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but of power. Power. Too much talking. The kingdom of God is a kingdom of power. Hebrews 13.8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Jesus is the same. You know, it's not like every, you know, thousand years Jesus gets a little weaker. He is the same, the same God, doing the same miracles, just as present and able, coming for your throat about your faith. Just like he was with his disciples. This is who he is. He is the same. It's time to get our fight back. God is, I really believe, searching the earth, looking for faith to partner with. Don't settle for powerless Christianity. Jesus was never okay with his disciples settling for a lack of faith. Hebrews eleven six, and without faith living within us, it would be impossible to please God. You can't even please God without faith. For we come to God in faith knowing that he is real and that he rewards the faith of those who passionately seek him. It's time to grow our faith. It's time to shake off the lack of expectation for God to move. It's time to feed our faith, to nurture it. There is so much negativity around us all the time just draining your faith. You have to be intentional about growing your faith. How are you growing your faith? Romans 10, 17, faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. How do you grow your faith? Read the Bible and believe it. You read the Bible, you hear the promise of God. The words of God are living and active. They change you, they transform you, they grow faith inside of you. Instead of just reading endless, like, negative news or whatever, consuming just, like, whatever you're consuming <laughs> endlessly, how about you be intentional about, we, we be intentional about growing our faith. Go find those testimonies of people that got completely healed, people that got delivered, that marriage that got restored, how God broke in and shifted that family, how that tree stood up in Sudan. Like, go find the stories. It will grow your faith. If you think about the time in your life where your faith felt the most active, the most vibrant, the most potent, you were probably doing that. You were probably consuming testimonies and stories and being in environments that was growing your faith, right? You were probably in the word and it was coming alive in you. These are the things that are growing our faith. And I'm telling you, church, we've got to get our fight back because there are too many people suffering. There is too much pain. There is too much brokenness in the world. I don't know about you, but my heart is tired of breaking all the time. I want to get my fight back in me to see things shift. Kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. This is the God we serve. This is what Christianity is. We are not victims to this world. Our God moves mountains. Our God silences storms. Our God sets the oppressed free. Our God heals. Our God delivers. Even death is not, can be undone. Jesus modeled that by, by raising Jairus' daughter, by raising Larius, by uh, Lazarus, by, by raising the, the widow's son, by raising himself, even death can be moved. Our God does the impossible. I don't want us just to hear this and go, that's so nice. I believe that. But then we look at our own mountain and our own storm and our own demonic oppression 
and we say, guess that's just how it is. That's not how it is. And it's time to get your fight back. I want to just read this over us as we close. Um, yeah, all right. Somebody, team, got some people. Okay, great. Let's go. I want to read this over us. These were Jesus' last words before he returned to the Father. He said this to his disciples, his last instructions. He said, go into all the world and preach to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe in my name. They will drive out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up snakes with their hands. And when they drink deadly poison, it will not hurt them at all. They replace their hands on sick people, and they will get well. This was the commission. This is how Jesus sends us out into the world. Quick pastoral asterisk here. This is not saying, hey, go drink poison. Hey, go play with snakes. That's not what we're doing here, okay? That's not what Jesus is saying. What Jesus is saying is anything you come up against, I'll overcome. There is nothing you can face. Ooh, snakes, poison. What's the craziest thing we can think of? My power will be greater than that. That's what he's saying. My power is greater. Guys, the God that moves mountains lives inside of you lives inside of you. The kingdom is inside of you. He has anointed you to go into the world to heal, to deliver, to set free, to bring hope, to bring life. And it's time to get our fight back. Amen? Amen. Will you stand with me as we close? I want us to sing this song that Miss Lee Rhonda led us in earlier. It was so good. And they sang it this morning. And I was like, yes, this is, this is what the Lord is challenging us to. So I want us to end by singing this. And as we sing this, I want you this morning to prophetically sing and declare this over your storm, your mountain, whatever it is you're facing. I want us to sing this. I want us to prophesy to ourselves. And I want us to remind ourselves what God can do. Yes, Lord. We declare this this morning, anything is possible. And God, may we not be found denying, unbelieving, that you are the God who does the impossible. God, I pray for every person in this room I pray for faith, fresh faith to be stirred up. Anywhere where anybody's lost their fight, God, I pray for fresh faith, radical faith to rise up. I pray that we would get hungry to hear the stories, that we would get hungry for the word, that we'd get, that we would, any part of us that's become cynical, that it would get broken off of us. Any part of us that's just got weary in waiting, that it would get healed. I pray, God, that faith would rise in this community, that faith would rise in our hearts, that faith would rise in our homes, and that we truly would see the impossible becoming possible for our eyes. Speak your blessings over every person in this community. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen, amen.